Hey everyone, Douglas here, Canon Market Analysis, and today I am starting a new series of videos where I take a look at the claims, arguments, and theories of those from the mainstream neoclassical economic schools of thought all the way to Austrian or Chicago schools, kind of the hard money crowd, and critique them or debunk them from an MMT heterodox understanding. Two quick things before we uh, get this uh, video underway. One, if this type of video intrigues you and you're not yet subscribed yet, make sure and do so and turn that notification bell on so you won't miss any updates going forward. And then number two, I plan on doing maybe one or two of these types of videos a month. I already have a few ideas uh, for future videos in the hopper, if you will, but uh, if there is anything you'd like me to take a look at, make sure you uh, drop a line in the comment section below and I'll check it out and see if it's something I can respond to. Anyway, let's, uh, let's get things underway. We're about to take a look at a video that was published by PragerU uh, discussing the potential dangers of the U.S. debt. PragerU, if you're unfamiliar with them, are kind of like a conservative right-wing think tank of sorts. And admittedly, this video is a bit of some low-hanging fruit. It's only about five minutes, five seconds long. But suffice to say, it is chock full of some easily debunkable claims. And it's also on a topic I know I've, I've spoken a lot about recently on this channel, but the reason I want to spend at least one more video on this topic is I think it's important to remember the most common arguments from the sound, from the sound money crowd uh, that they were making in the years following the great financial crisis. As you can see, this video was published almost seven years ago to the time I'm recording this. Uh, since the recent kind of public rise of MMT, I've seen a lot of people, especially from the economically conservative sound money crowd, forget that this was the main argument against deficit spending in the years following the great financial crisis. And still today, it's, it's a very widely held belief. So without any further ado, let's jump right into the first clip here. If you are under, say, 30, you have a tsunami-sized problem coming towards you, and you probably don't even know it. That killer wave is the national debt. All right, right out of the gate, PragerU is setting the stage for a calamity in the not too distant future. Interestingly, he calls out those under the age of 30, which when published would have uh, just barely included yours truly. I have nothing I really want to refute in this clip. I'll spend the rest of the video doing that. But I at least wanted to point out that the reason they give for caring about the issue, uh, the, or the, 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 the public debt, is the economic impact and potential danger they see from a larger rising public deficit. Countries like people go into debt when they spend more than they have. You and I buy things with the money we earn. Governments buy things with money they get from taxes. When spending outstrips revenue, the government is in the hole. Okay, first things first, it is very misleading and shows a gross misunderstanding of the basics of fiscal spending to say that governments spend what is brought in from tax revenue. In a nation that spends its own currency, where the currency isn't pegged or backed by anything, we'll call it a, a sovereign currency nation, those nations have to spend first. They have to spend the currency into existence before they can collect it back in taxation. Just think about it. Where could the first tax dollar come from? if it wasn't spent into existence in the first place. Now, this brings up a good question on what is the purpose of taxes, but we'll leave that discussion uh, for a, another day. Now, the second claim that if a government wants to spend more than it has, like a household, it must go into debt is not technically untrue, but it's entirely misleading. The household analogy is very inappropriate and will woefully mislead you in the kind of basics of fiscal spending. Now, it is true that a currency user, this would be a household, you or I, or a business, that if you want to spend more than you'll have, you'll need to go into debt to do so. However, the government is the currency issuer. So by definition, there is nowhere for that money to come from other than, again, spending it into existence in the first place. Just think of it in its logical order. Where else could the first dollar come from if they aren't spent into existence to begin with? Uh, this is a critical misunderstanding usually found in the, sound, in the sound money crowd. And the impact of this, why it's important to really grasp this dynamic is because this means that by definition, government spending the U.S. debt is the private sector savings. To put it another way, the public deficit is the private sector surplus. And if the public sector, that is the government, wants to run a surplus or reduce its debt, the private sector must go into debt to accomplish this. Let that sink in a bit because uh, we'll come back to this point at the uh, near the end of this video. Right now, the hole is $17 trillion deep. This is an incomprehensible number. 
Interestingly, I really don't think it's all that incomprehensible. If you take what we were just discussing about the debt being equal to private savings and maybe ask a question like, how much is saved up in all 401ks? Well, you end up with about the same amount as the U.S. debt. In other words, the total debt becomes quite comprehensible when you realize it's just the total savings for the private sector. Another way to look at it is there are about uh, 28, tr there's about 28 trillion in debt uh, for the U.S. and about 330 million people in America. Divide that out per person, and you're looking at about $85,000 per person in savings on average. I realize this is not equally distributed, but again, that's not the point right now. This isn't really terribly incomprehensible anymore. Right now, most investors believe the United States is a safe bet. They believe, in other words, that they'll get the money they loan to the U.S. back with interest. But this can't go on indefinitely. At some point, investors are going to say, you have too much debt. You're a bad risk. No more money. Okay, just like the tax dollars being needed for spending is a myth, the U.S. Uh, needing loans to finance its spending is also a myth. Granted, the U.S. does finance all of its debt through bond sales. This is true, but in order to purchase bonds, the dollar, again, must be in existence to begin with. If everyone decided altogether, all at once, to never buy U.S. Treasury bonds again, the ability for the U.S. to continue to spend would remain intact. Now, granted, there is a lot of short-term financing that happens in the financial world that is heavily reliant on bond sales, but that doesn't inhibit the U.S.'s ability to spend. Again, the process in logical order, just like taxes, is, is that the U.S. spends first those dollars into existence, and then they are used to purchase bonds after they're created. What happens then? We don't have to guess. We can look at Europe, specifically Greece. Okay, here's the uh, the U.S. is going to turn into Greece claim. If uh, if you're relatively new to the macro investing world, you may think this is a bit of a silly argument. But following the European sovereign debt crisis, the argument that the U.S. was going to turn into Greece was kind of all the rage. Everyone. And every business news channel was explaining how if the U.S. doesn't cut its spending, uh, they're going to become Greece. Obviously, years after uh, this is all played out, it's kind of a goofy argument looking back. But the reason why the U.S. was never going to become Greece in the first place is because the monetary and fiscal policies in place are polar opposites. The U.S., uh, as I was explaining earlier, is a sovereign currency issuer. Their spending happens when Congress and the Treasury want it to happen. Greece, on the other hand, and uh, every member nation to the Eurozone, for that matter, does not have sovereign control over their spending. They do have to borrow to spend. Uh, the Eurozone, which Greece is a part of, has its deficit spending controlled by a, uh, by a legal uh, constraint called the Maastricht Treaty, which is essentially sets how much debt each member country is allowed to accumulate. So Greece really was at the mercy of those willing to lend money to uh, the member to it and uh, and the member nations likewise in order to spend which again is uh, the complete opposite of what uh, what the situation is in the US here's another point at the time I'm giving this course the interest on our debt is very low around two percent but what happens when the interest rate rises from two percent to the much more normal five percent? as it inevitably will. Where is the U.S. going to get the money to pay the higher interest on its enormous debt? Okay, quick point uh, that I don't want to spend too, too much time on, but needs to be made. There is no reason to believe that 5% is a more normal level of interest rates. In fact, I think you can probably make a pretty strong argument that, uh, that zero rates would actually be the normal rate and everything else is abnormal or a manip a manipulated rate. But that discussion um, yeah, would re probably require its own video and maybe something I'll do down the line. But as for paying interest on the debt, this is a fair point to at least think about, but not because we're borrowing the money from anyone, uh, but from the more political reality of what interest on treasuries really are. They are a risk-free return. You could almost call it a universal basic income for people who already have money. It is true that in the U.S., if you have savings in dollars, the U.S. will pay you a risk-free return if you're willing to save those dollars as bonds. If you don't have dollar savings, you're not afforded this privilege of uh, risk-free money. Granted, 
it's not a great return and you could probably get a much better return if you're willing to uh, if you're willing to risk on other assets but it still is an income stream that is entirely risk free now i think you can see where i'm going or at least where i could go with this uh with this argument does it make sense politically to pay people with money to save their money and exclude people who don't have money from this scheme again the answer probably deserves its own video but when in that context and when in that context i think it makes the discussion of bonds and rates uh, much more meaningful and relatable to kind of the average american and and the u.s economy as a whole then there's the question of who these investors are who are loaning us all this money the biggest investor right now is china not exactly a trusted ally the more money they loan us the more influence they have over us maybe they'll never exercise this power but do we really want to give them the option okay china is not lending us money what actually happened is the u.s had bought and still continues to buy chinese goods and services and china in return has used those dollars that they received from u.s citizens and corporations buying chinese goods to buy bonds china has no control over the u.s because of this reality the u.s received real goods and services and china received dollars which they are saving in the form of bonds again the real question to ask here is a more social political economic question and that is what is the risk of the u.s not being able to create or manufacture the goods and services domestically that they have bought from overseas counterparts again a discussion for another day but at the same point if china or any other country decides it no longer wants to manufacture the goods and services um, that the u.s consumes the u.s will need to produce them domestically and admittedly this does pose a real economic threat but it's not a financial threat as this video implies and consider one final point is it moral to saddle future generations with this massive debt they had little or nothing to do with how would you feel about yourself if you knew that you were leaving your children on the hooks for debts you incurred during your life? You had a great time living in a big house, driving a nice car, but you never paid for these things. You left it to your son or daughter to pick up the tab. That's why the people who should care the most about the national debt are young people. They're the ones who will be stuck with the bill. All right, the classic what about the kids argument. This will be the last clip I take a look at from this video, and it is really the most dangerous argument made in the video because if you're following what I've been saying up to this point, the real danger is not saddling future generations with enough debt uh, or with, with too much debt. It's not saddling our future generations with enough debt, or more importantly, not spending enough to not only meet the needs of the financial sector, but also ensure that the next generation has the infrastructure and services available to them to live long healthy productive and successful lives listen if you're in retirement age you've lived through some of the greatest prosperity that the u.s has ever seen there are uh, a multitude of institutions and infrastructure that are all in place because the u.s chose to spend on them this is the legacy you will leave the next generation the debt is just the accounting for what that looks like so to bring this back around now to investing the main theme here is that the u.s is at risk with a large public debt and the point of this video is to convince viewers that the large public debt load will cause them some economic harm in the future now i realize that this video is not trying to give any investment advice but if people who watch this came to any economic conclusion it would have to have seen the ballooning deficit over the last seven years since this was recorded um, and consider that a major risk factor many perma bears along the way have been in this camp for this very sole reason eventually the debt will catch up to us and we'll have uh, runaway inflation or run runaway rates and I i'm sure you've heard these arguments and stories but the, ex the exact opposite is is true it's only been in the times of a shrinking public debt that the U.S. has seen major financial meltdowns, most notably following the 1929 crash and depression and the 2000 crash and uh, following recession and eventual great financial crisis. Uh, following even the most basic uh, understanding of MMT that uh, that the public deficit is the private sector savings. You'll quickly realize that a tsunami of federal debt 
does not pose an economic threat. Instead, the exact opposite tr is true. The largest threat is to find ourselves in a desert wasteland of no fiscal spending. The discussion of what the federal debt is being spent on is an important discussion to have. Certainly frivolous spending is a waste of uh, perfectly good resources, but the deficit spending that is the U.S. creating new dollars, spending them into existence, is an absolute necessity to create a stable economy and for us investors, a stable financial sector. So I'm going to wrap this video up here. He goes on to talk about a solution to the supposed problem. Obviously, if the problem is, uh, is uh, based on a misdiagnosis, uh, the cure won't fix anything. So that's it for this one. Uh, don't forget, if you're new, make sure you uh, hit that subscribe button and turn on the notification bells. And uh, if you found this video specifically uh, are you know, quite uh, helpful, make sure you hit that like button as well. And then last but not least, if you're an active trader, active investor, and you uh, you like what I'm doing here on this channel, Merging, MMT, Heterodox, Macro View with Elliott Wave and Technical Analysis, make sure you check out my Patreon page patreon.com slash canon ma for multiple extensive updates each week otherwise good trading everyone and we'll see you next time bye, -bye.